My guest today is Anna Booth, co-founder of CoSolve, which provides independent mediation, facilitation and arbitration services in workplaces in Australia, New Zealand and South Africa. Anna Hine, welcome to In Her Shoes. Hello there. Thank you for joining us. My great pleasure. Give us an overview of what CoSolve does. Well, CoSolve, as you said, uh, is an independent uh, facilitation company and we provide uh, third party neutral uh, facilitation services, particularly in workplaces and particularly in unionised workplaces between unions and management, uh, where agreement reaching is important. So it could be anything from a particular change in the workplace, it could be uh, in terms and conditions of employment, uh, or it could even be a dispute that needs to be resolved. And so we'll come in um, and really create a space within which parties can talk to one another and help them reach an agreement. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk to you about leadership and especially women in leadership mm -hmm. roles. Where do you feel that business is going as far as what business needs from leaders? Well, I think the, the most important thing, uh, whether it's actually leaders indeed or followers, is character. So, you know, I think that leaders need to exhibit um, great strength of character, great high integrity, um, a, a, a really um, encompassing understanding of their organisation and the people within it and they need to demonstrate great care and empathy and they need to be open to others' suggestions um, and they need to demonstrate that they're genuinely listening. They need to alter and, and modify and shape their decisions um, by listening and then they of course need to be decisive and act and action is really terribly important. I think mm. one of the things that frustrates people in organisations enormously is prevarication and paralysis. How well equipped are women to take on the leadership roles, not only the roles that are available now, but those that you envisage will become available? I think they're enormously equipped uh, and of course you know women are um, leaders at all levels. I think one thing we think about with leadership is the position of the leader but actually leadership is a practice, a set of behaviours and that is exhibited at all levels of organisations. So you know I've been in hospitals where um, uh, assistance in nursing for example which is one of the frontline unregistered nursing positions where there are leaders in that group. Uh, so, you know, women have um, the abilities and the, uh, and, the, and the characteristics that I've described, uh, I think, uh, that are necessary of leaders. Um, I'm loath to say that we have them more than men. Uh, I do think that we tend to generalise and that can be dangerous. But uh, what I would say is that women are adept at uh, thinking broadly. Um, at uh, understanding the interdependencies between things. Um, you know, there's that, uh, that sort of notion that we're great at multitasking. Um, I'm not sure whether we are actually any better <laughs> at it or, or not than men. I've not really seen any good empirical data on that. I know we feel we are, but that's because we're coming from our own you know, experience. Uh, but I think that, uh, that what we as women can do is understand, uh, stand in the shoes very well, um, just to steal the title of your segment here, um, you know, of others. Um, and um, have them see that and connect with them uh, and then be able to lead them on the basis of uh, you know, a genuine understanding of what that other person's needs are, which is, I think, the best leadership you can give. You mentioned action earlier and the importance mm. of taking action. Is there an area where women are uh, perhaps missing opportunities because the actions that they are or they are not taking? Mm. Mm. Look, for me, I think the great systemic failure um, in women moving from you know the pipeline as we know I mean let's take the law as an example um, as you know I chair also the law firm Slater and Gordon so there are more young women lawyers than there are young men there are more women graduating from law now than men just slightly more it's mm. not you know 70 percent it's about 52 53 percent something like that maybe it's more 55 um, and therefore we see a lot of young women coming into law firms but like in all organizations uh, we see the, as the uh, status of the role and, and the um, pay also of the role increases, we see fewer and fewer women. So right. what's going on there? Now, you know, the traditional explanation is that we're taking time out of the workforce to have children and of course that has an impact. Um, but what I see across all industry is women taking functional roles and not line management roles. Right. And to me, that's the critical piece that, you know, if you are in a construction um, company, then choose not just project management, 
but something you know engineering or something operational uh, that really gets you into the guts of the business. If you're in manufacturing, uh, choose not HR, but actually choose factory management. Um, if you're in the media, um, you know, choose uh, not just the uh, perhaps the finance role, um, but actually the the real sort of heart and guts of of the operations, the the chief operating officer, something like that. So, get involved, down and dirty in the business. And of course, you know, women do do that. In the the interesting areas where women do that is health. So you'll see, um, particularly in the nursing management stream, you know, the very senior roles are actually occupied by women because they've got that operational experience. Mm. Um, mind you, there aren't too many CEOs or chief um, health chief chief officers of hospitals who come from the nursing stream. So that's another issue as well in <laughs> health. But you know, I think just choosing the actual operational end of the business very early on in your career will set you in the right pathway. I think certainly for women who are looking to get on boards, mm. having that breadth of skill or mm. skills in those I don't want to say harder mm. uh, no, hitting, it, but those it, more, as you said, not pipeline. It's the machinery of the organisation. I mean, they're the pro basically the profit centres yeah. as opposed to the cost centres, really. That's a great so way to break it up. enablers, which is your marketing and your HR and your finance. You know, those things have, have all been, uh, perhaps with a slight exception of finance, been well occupied by women. But when it comes to the actual operations, it's and, and you're looking for people with engineering qualifications, then it, they, those roles have been occupied by men. At the Australian Business Women's Network, we're big advocates of mentoring mm, yes, as yes. a career path, as a way yes. to grow your business. Yeah. What role has mentoring played for you? It's played a, a big role. I actually think that um, probably you know talk to anybody and you'll find that um, once they think hard about what mentoring is, they've been mentored even if they didn't know they were being mentored. So in my early career, I was mentored uh, by Fred Peterson, who was the National Secretary of the Clothing and Allied Trades Union, who first employed me when I was 21. Uh, and uh, he was in that role for around, um, oh, I guess, maybe 15 of the 18 years, that uh, maybe a little less, but you know, he was there for a long time and, and he really did guide me in a whole range of ways. Um, more recently, I've had some uh, deliberate mentoring, as in um, formal mentoring, uh, around governance, and that's really proving uh, very helpful. So, you know, what's great about mentoring is it is an equal relationship that you have with your mentor. It's not a junior relationship, but it's a it's a it's it's a time when you can actually speak to someone with expertise in an area, um, and learn from them and apply some of that, and then go back and check in. You know, how did that go for you? And that's been great. Mm -hmm. You've had um, a very successful career. You've worked in many, many areas. Um, for those watching who are perhaps at the start of their career, tell us some of the things that have served you well, mm. uh, values or principles mm. or strategies. Mm. I've learned that values aren't just something that you stick in a mission statement and forget, you know, that they actually have to be lived and spoken about in a practical kind of a way. So at Slater and Gordon, you know, we wouldn't have a board meeting where we weren't talking about whether a particular decision impacted positively or compatibly uh, or otherwise, you know, with our values. So um, even our tagline, um, no challenge too great, uh, I think is one of the rare taglines that actually sums us up, you know, so that we are there for individuals uh, whose uh, access to justice would be diminished or denied you know in, if we were not around um, and I guess coming from the trade union movement um, you know the values about uh, supporting somebody who is vulnerable and unable to support themselves is really you know that, that's been with me for a long time I, I think a second thing uh, more recently actually uh, through my work at the bank at ME bank uh, which is owned by industry super funds um, is really work on the backbone of the company so to get your uh, all of your architecture and your machinery in place is really important to be highly professional even in my little consultancy co-solve you know whether in some companies like a bank that'll be your risk management systems and your technology you know really work on that and make sure that that's robust and and stable. In a little company like CoSolve, you know, it's our website and our um, IP and our uh, sort of pro processes that we would use to introduce ourselves to a company and, and the kind of certainty that we would give parties about our independence. So, yeah. you know, just get that backbone right. Um, and I guess the third thing uh, also comes from CoSolve, which is to really take into account the needs of stakeholders in decisions, not just to be nice, 
but because if you don't, the decision will unravel. So we want decisions that are actionable and sustainable and that uh, improve our lives, be it our personal family lives or organisational lives or the lives of our country. And let's take you know, our current debate around um, reducing carbon pollution. You know, we meet, need to take decisions that really, um, we spend a lot of time on up front actually calculating the impacts on people and working that through and incorporating that into the implementation because that's how decisions stick. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.